Okay, so this is the Pioneer SX950 stereo receiver, which I did some repairs to in a couple of previous videos, and uh, we're about to do a performance check on it. It's currently hooked up to all my test gear, and it's uh, warming up prior to the test, uh, putting it about 30 watts per channel into a dummy load. So let's just go through the test setup. So this is obviously the receiver itself, and uh, here we've got uh, a channel switch, which is going to select which channel we're measuring, and it's connected to one of these speaker outputs on the back. To the other speaker outputs, they're of course just in parallel, uh, we have a switchable 4 or 8 ohm dummy load connected, and uh, we've down there you can see we've got a rather special mains cord connected which has the ground pin cut so this receiver is not getting any ground through the grid in order to avoid loops even though it has a grounded connector and that's because uh, we are getting ground out of this uh, HP339A a distortion meter although we're not getting uh, it directly through it because we're actually uh, going to be running with uh, the ground lifted here and the ground coming through these uh, B and C's going to the monitoring oscilloscope but uh, if you're not aware this uh, is a HP 339A distortion meter uh, it works by putting out a very clean sine wave on these two plugs here feeding it into an input of the amplifier then we've got the output of the amplifier coming in here in parallel with the dumb load of course and uh, it's going to measure everything that's not the signal being fed to the amplifier, so if we feed a 1 kilohertz signal to it, we're going to measure everything except 1 kilohertz. It'll filter the 1 kilohertz out, and everything that's not being fed into it is, uh, of course, noise and distortion. So we also got a Brymon meter there measuring the output voltage of the amplifier, which we can use to calculate the output power. And uh, up here we've got a uh, monitoring oscilloscope with a camera set up to look at it like so. And uh, obviously in the scope you can see one very clean sine wave uh, that's connected straight to the output of the amplifier and you can see one uh, rather dirty jagged wave and uh, that's connected to the monitoring output of the uh, distortion meter and that is the same signal as is being fed into the actual meter of the distortion set and we've got a 1 volt uh, P to, uh, one volt RMS even uh, scale, uh, signal coming through there and that uh, just correlates to the amount of distortion for the given range so we're at 0.03% distortion full scale if we had exactly 0.03% distortion we'd be getting 1 volt RMS and the meter would be pegged to the right and this just provides a very graphical representation of the kind of distortion we're getting because it, as you can see that sine wave look, looks uh, absolutely perfect to the naked eye because there's just uh, something like 0.02% distortion on it but with the uh, monitor signal we can see that we've got some uh, second order harmonic distortion it seems it's about third order, it's a bit difficult to actually get it out and some little weird harmonic peg coming around every down going cycle but it's you know, mostly just to give us an, a rough subjective idea of what the distortion looks like for troubleshooting purposes. I'm quite certain we're not going to see anything really bad with this amplifier. It seems to be doing quite okay in preliminary measurements. But uh, I suppose we'll find out. Let's just uh, get this stupid camera to expose correctly and uh, well, let's get on our way. This guy should be getting reasonably warmed up by now. Alright, so now that the receiver is properly warmed up, let's uh, just start with uh, a, a pure power test. So we're rated for 85 watts per channel into 8 ohms at uh, less than 0.1% distortion and I think it's going to meet that goal. And we're going to use a 30 kHz low pass filter because uh, it's specified for 20Hz to 20K and that usually means that the manufacturer has been using it rock solid 20 kilohertz low pass filter when testing it so it wouldn't really be fair to actually measure it full bandwidth the, the HP 339A will go up to about 600 kilohertz so that would be a bit unfair 
let's just uh, crank it up to uh, 85 watts per channel is the same as about 26 volts. So we're starting with the left channel. to 6.08 oh, that's close and I think we are very well within the specification we are at just about just about 0.017 percent distortion on the right channel on the left channel and on the right one and oh, what's that 0.015 so as far as the pure power output is concerned, this unit is doing quite well for itself. Most of these older receivers tend to be a bit on the low side since I set them to 240 volts on the switch on the back. Since we run 230 volts here in Northern Europe and uh, the two, we usually just get to choose between 220 and 240. And 220 means that everything will run at too high a voltage and basically make all the caps explode in a couple of years. So I prefer to be on the safe side, but uh, this guy certainly got him for the right way around. Built with a, quite a fair amount of headroom, so let's see uh, what it will do without uh, surpassing its 0.1% uh, rated uh, distortion figure. So since I switched it to 0.3% full scale, we are looking not to surpass the 1 on the uh, 3 full scale there. There we go, clipping a bit. That's just about 0.1, so we're at 27.5 volts. Yeah, 27.6, and that's about 95 watts. Now, right channel. Yeah, I'll call that 95 watts as well. But if we look at the uh, distortion waveform on this channel, it does have a little tiny tendency to oscillate still even after my repairs in the previous video but you know, I wouldn't call that an issue since we have already surpassed its rated power if we're going to hard clipping yeah it's that's just clipping really that's looking quite okay uh, the same thing on the left channel bit of oscillation tendencies when clipping but yeah I'd give this a pass. Yeah, I'd definitely give it a pass since it's working just fine at its rated power and it's not acting funny until you surpass its rated power. So yeah, raw power rating to 8 ohms is A-OK -okay on this unit. So let's switch to uh, 4 ohms and it should do 110 watts per channel uh, which is uh, 21 volts, so let's see what it'll do, we're on the left channel right now That's just about 110 watts, and we certainly seem to be well within spec. Yes, uh, the left channel is uh, producing 0.017% distortion, and the right channel 0.013. When we're dealing with distortion levels of this low, I don't really pay much attention to the uh, oscilloscope because. We're just having so little distortion in the signal to go by already, so there's no real cause to actually analyse the actual distortion waveform, since we know that we're in spec. And well, let's just swap back to the left channel and see how much power we can push with this thing into 4 ohms without surpassing the 0.1% rated distortion figure. And there we go, clipping 23.8 volts, and that's uh, just about 145 watts. And right channel, 
23 and a half volts. Yeah, that's about 140 watts. And that's certainly not bad, not bad at all. I'm quite happy with these results thus far. I don't want to keep the amplifier pushing too much power into 4 ohms for too long since uh, the 110 watts figure is certainly going to be heat derived so if I keep that up for too long it's just going to overheat and explode on me and I'd uh, rather not have that. Either way I'd say this amplifier is uh, certainly performing very well indeed. I'd actually be quite happy to call this performance thus far to be even better than it probably did out of the factory, so that's very good news indeed. So let's uh, move away from the power tests and uh, and see what kind of a noise floor we've got in this, now that it's properly warmed up. Uh, I know that these uh, Pioneer SX series receivers have a tendency to have a rather high noise floor. That's uh, one of my real issues with them. They sadly have really skimped out on the design on the preamplifier on them. I believe I specify to uh, a signal to noise ratio of uh, 90 decibels A weighted which is not very good. We're going to measure the unweighted noise floor and uh, that's going to be considerably worse since an A weighting essentially means that you're uh, filtering out all the high frequency and all the low frequency stuff and basically focusing on, on a bit one kilohertz. I've got a couple of shorting plugs installed on the tape one connector so we'll just switch sources to tape one and that should give us uh, a very quiet output about as quiet as it will go. Right now we've got the volume set to uh, as low as it will go, so let's just uh, switch the range to a very low voltage scale. So now we're at uh, minus 60 decibel volts full scale, uh, still a low past the 30 kilohertz of course, and uh, we're at uh, minus 62, 64, 66, and minus, oh, we'll still 4 ohms. Yeah, about minus 67 decibel volts. That, that's sadly not very impressive, not very impressive at all. You, a very good performing receiver is going to be well below minus 80. And the other channel seems to be performing pretty much the same. And now that I've jotted that down into my spreadsheet, we actually end up with a signal to noise ratio of uh, 95.74 decibels as it's uh, usually rated on these receivers that means that the ratio of the full output voltage to the noise floor of a receiver is uh, about 95.7 decibels so an, an unweighted signal to noise ratio of 95.7 decibels is actually considerably better than uh, it would have performed out of a factory since it was specified for a pre-amplifier signal-to-noise ratio of uh, uh, about 90 decibels and a power-amplifier signal-to-noise ratio of 100 decibels. Uh, we would have expected these uh, signal-to-noise ratio of the entire system to be worse than that, but we are pretty much right in the middle of the two values. And that makes sense because this particular SX950 has uh, they had all the transistors in the preamplifier uh, replaced with lower noise equivalents because these have issues with the I believe they're the 2SA726 transistors and their complement they go very noisy over time and they are very noisy to begin with and uh, the mo modern transistors which were in installed in place of those are performing better so by doing that we have at least brought this unit into slightly more high performance territory although sadly still very noisy. And as a final test we'll just check the damping factor of the amplifier i.e. the output impedance of it. It's not specified very well, it's specified for a damping factor of 25 which is actually very poor by any standards. It's almost in, <laughs> into tube amp range or in the basically 10 and below. But uh, that means we'll just uh, crack it up to half output power, one channel at a time. 
So that's at 80, 40 watts, 17 volts. And uh, we'll set the meter to uh, measure relative uh, once we've had it stabilized. Oh, that looks pretty stable. Now this is our loaded voltage, 16.943. And we'll just uh, switch the load off. And that gives us a voltage differential of uh, 0 0.21 volts. And that actually gives us a damping factor of uh, 80 and uh, an output impedance of 0.1 ohms. Now that's actually far exceeding the original specification. That's a bit curious actually. You usually don't see two great variations in the damping factor since it's mostly got to do with how the feedback circuit of the amplifier is designed. But uh, for some reason this one has uh, probably gained a lot with its uh, new output transistors which might be of a considerably higher electrical specification than the original ones from the late 70s. And well, let's just uh, check the right channel as well. And that gives us a, an output impedance of 90 milliohms or a damping factor of 88. So that one's even better. And if we just have a look at the distortion waveform while quickly swapping the load around, turning it on and off, and swapping between 4 and 8 ohms, we can see that there's really no funny business going on there on either of the channels. One of them still has that little peak on the negative uh, end of a waveform, which you know, kind of looks like a bit of crossover distortion. Might be that it, it would be happy with a slight bump in bias current, but since all the distortion measurements are well, well, well within specs, I would, I'm not going to really bother with that. It, it, it's, it's performing well enough, really. But all in all, I'm, I'm very happy with these tests. And it hasn't even gone up in smoke. Although I can tell you that there's a rather considerable aroma of uh, warm vintage amplifier in this room right now. And just how hot do one of these old vintage amplifiers run when you do this kind of stuff? Well, you're not very kind on them. The heating on this one's about 80 degrees hot. I'd actually better turn the voltage down now. You could actually explode an amp while doing this kind of stuff because while they say that they're continuously rated, that's not always the case. And after shooting all of that, I took the time to very properly and thoroughly fill out my giant amplifier test spreadsheet with this SX950. So let's just go through it and see whether or not it actually passed its testing. So right here I've written down some of the specifications for it. Uh, we've got the rated output power into 8 ohms at 85 watts per channel and the 110 watts into 4 ohms. And we've got some uh, THD specs, uh, which is 0.1% uh, at 85 watts, 0.05% at 43 watts, 0.05% at 1 watt, and 0.1% at 110 watts into 4 ohms. We've also got a, a frequency range with a tolerance, which is 15 hertz to 40 kilohertz uh, for the preamplifier and a much more generous one for the power amplifier. But since the preamplifier was uh, always connected, uh, that's the limiting factor. And we've got the 25 rated uh, damping factor. And uh, then we have the uh, sadly rather useless uh, signal to noise ratio specs. Now, these, they really never in the manual for this old, these old audio things, uh, they never go into enough detail about how they actually measure this signal to noise ratio in order for it to mean anything. Like, uh, we've got a 90 decibel rating for the preamplifier. Well, that's a 90 decibel rating between what? Is the volume turned all the way up or all, all the way down? Are we looking at 90 decibel between uh, nothing being out but have a full scale output voltage of the amplifier? Or are we looking at 90 decibels between any signal level put out by the preamplifier and nothing being output? Or are we looking at 90 decibel signal to noise while it's putting its signal? They just don't tell you. So th these specs are the guidelines, I guess. They, they just don't have much meaning to them, sadly. 
I've also specified how the testing's been done. You're free to read that if you want to, but it's nothing too important. So let's just start out with the uh, full power range uh, distortion figures. Now keep in mind we're measuring THD plus N, which is uh, total harmonic distortion, which is uh, distortion which is uh, in tune, so to speak, with the uh, test signal and noise, which is just a random noise like white noise or pink noise or just pops and cracks and stuff like that. And uh, it passed with flying colors on both channels, uh, with uh, most of the test being even below the more stricter specification they gave of below 0.05 percent. Well actually it did that even uh, above its rated power output it, because uh, we were at only at the point to uh, 0.185 percent to THD and noise at 95 watts which is uh, 10 watts above its uh, top rated power which is excellent and we've got similar figures for both channels. And we do see that uh, uh, the noise floor of the device is uh, quite visible in the very low power testing. This is the 50 milliwatt setting up around the top, which is just 633 millivolts output of the entire device. And we've got a THD plus N figure of 0.07. Now that doesn't sound like much, but the fact that this figure is 0.07 and then very quickly drops down when we get to one word, we're at 0.175. That means that we're dominated by noise rather than harmonic distortion. And if we were to measure at lower and lower voltage levels, we would just see ever increasing uh, distortion since uh, we are being overtaken by noise. And uh, to give you a bit of a comparison, I've loaded up the test sheet for one of my favorite amplifiers ever, the Yamaha AX590 which is a rather mid-range late 90s amplifier but it performs excellently it has uh, one of the lowest noise floors I've ever measured and if we take a look at uh, its test it's basically done the same way it's a similar class amplifier uh, we've got it sitting at 0 0.00 something percent distortion all the way down to 50 milliwatts we don't see the gradual rise in distortion as we approach the bottom of the power range because there just isn't any real noise to measure in this amplifier because it's insanely low noise it's several orders of magnitude or less noise than the Pioneer but if we move on with the Pioneer SX950 uh, I measured the distortion at the rated power it's 0.017% which is well within spec on one channel 0.015 on the other which is also excellent well within spec and uh, pretty much the same figures for 4 ohms at 110 watts excellent uh, the power at the rated distortion of 0.1% was 95 watts and at 8 ohms and 145 watts of air about uh, at 4 ohms which is considerably above the specified power output and the clipping power at the percent distortion at 8 ohms was 103 watts roughly and the clipping power at 4 ohms was almost 160 watts so it certainly puts out to well above its rated power if you push it although if you kept it running at 4 ohms at this level it would overheat and explode eventually no doubt about it so output impedance I tested at both 8 and 4 ohms and it's uh, about 0.1 ohms. If you have a capacitively coupled amplifier you can sometimes get a bit of weirdness where it will measure uh, different output impedances at uh, different uh, uh, load impedances. That's what I, why I have this uh, 4 and 8 ohm a distinction on the output impedance test. But as you can see this one's just saying we've got 0.1 ohms in all the tests roughly and uh, that's an acceptable figure. Most modern amplifiers are going to perform over a hundred damping factor but once you start getting up uh, over 50 yeah it's unlikely to give you any performance issues unless you have a very particular application. Now if you have a very low damping factor i.e. a high output impedance you're going to get a lot of distortion and ringing in your speakers and that's a large part of what causes the tube amp sound they just have that to transform and f basically feedback less design which just makes the speakers move around without a lot of control from the amplifier 
But if we move on to that, we get into the real issue of these old Pioneer SX series receivers, which is the noise floor. And we've got uh, about 450 microvolts of noise, most of it's coming fed free from the preamplifier. Uh, coming, but we've got 450 microvolts or minus 67 decibel volts uh, at the speaker terminals, and that's just very poor. Uh, it's basically in the same range as a Li-Pi, you know, the $20 cheapo China amp you can get. That's the kind of performance we're looking at, and if we compare it to the Yamaha, we can see that it's down in the tens of microvolts range. 39 microvolts and 220 if you turn the volume up whereas the Pioneer is at 540 when you turn the volume up so yeah these Pioneers they don't play well with sensitive speakers and I, I'm i the kind of person who's really bothered by noisy amps so I really never use this thing sadly but uh, curiously, <laughs> curiously, since uh, this is such a powerful amplifier, it's actually got a relatively decent uh, signal-to-noise ratio in how it's uh, normally measured. Now, again, signal-to-noise ratio on consumer gear, it's a bit of a bog, because the manufacturers usually rate it as... Uh, I've written here, they short out the output, take a test, measure how much noise voltage is there, is there in the amplifier sitting idle, then they turn it up to the maximum output power and note how much power it's putting out, and the ratio between those two numbers is what they will specify as the signal to noise ratio. Now the actual signal to noise ratio is what we've got here, where we're measuring the noise present in the signal while we're putting through a signal and uh, th this is going to be nowhere near as good as uh, the specified signal to noise ratio because the amplifier is actually doing stuff here we're, we're looking at something like minus 60 something decibels of the noise and crap in the signal whereas yeah 95 is certainly a much nicer looking number but I suppose you can't blame them for trying to get consumers to buy this stuff, although it's a dirty tactic. Anyway, after that I did a uh, frequency response test and it actually basically fails this test since uh, the amplifier is specified for a band power bandwidth of, uh, what was it, 15 hertz to 40 kilohertz uh, plus zero minus 1 dB. And uh, we've basically got a minus 3 dB point at 22 kHz for both channels. So something's a bit up with that. Uh, that's certainly not uh, how the amplifier's intended to work. So there's something not right in this thing. But uh, given that uh, we're still talking about uh, a small roll off. Uh, above the audible spectrum and indeed if we look at the 20 kilohertz test I did here uh, we had only a minus 0.4 decibel drop off so while it's actually outside of spec I'm willing to call this amplifier good enough for general use I'm not going to bother troubleshooting the issue further unless it gets worse now what is a bit more troublesome is the harmonic distortion and noise we have of these higher frequencies where well, we're actually out of spec as well with about 0.2% distortion. That, that's that's indicative of some something going not quite right. It could be some ceramic caps getting a bit too aged. Uh, it could really be anything. Uh, I have analysed the uh, sco signal getting the scope when it's uh, pushing out these uh, higher frequencies and it basically is turning the signal into a kind of triangle wave, so that would mean we have lots of I believe second order harmonic distortion which is really weird, you wouldn't expect that in a solid state device but uh, that just speaks for it being some passive component starting to go a bit out of spec anyway on the low end everything's just fine, we have very little distortion in the very low frequency range since it's basically close to DC so harmonic distortion is a lot easier to get away with the feedback and the power bandwidth extends below 10 hertz so that's all nice and dandy so all in all I would say that uh, this amplifier has uh, passed its test and I'm going to put it back together and 
enjoy it or just put it on a shelf for another few years. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you found this to be at least somewhat interesting. Uh, cheerio! And before we leave this old pioneer permanently, I just want to remark about just how giant these old pioneer receivers are. Because on top of it, I've put uh, a normal 19 inch audio rack size uh, stereo amplifier. And as you can see, the 950 is just uh, considerably wider and it's deep and taller as well. These are actually wider than a normal 19 inch rack device. I can just uh, take this rack mount filter and it is not as wide as the Pioneer 950. These things are big, proper big. Cheerio.